Thank you very much. Um, so the time is now is, is the title of this, and it's all about progressive assurance on major complex infrastructure projects and programs. And what I'd like to do is talk about my experience to date, um, just really explore what assurance is, what progressive assurance is and how it works, and then what we can learn from this going forward as an industry. So a little bit about me first, um, Vedran's kindly introduced me. Uh, some of the big projects I've worked on, both as a civil engineer and the programme manager, is uh, Jubilee Line Canary Wharf Station, which is great now to see the sister station behind her on the Queen Elizabeth Line, um, really, really ready to rock and roll. Um, the Royal Docks, which is regeneration, the biggest regeneration scheme at the time um, in Europe. Great fun at the Strategic Rail Authority, um, looking at project and program management, bringing all the rail projects together, whether it's network rail, TfL, London Underground, actually having a, you know, a proper project management approach to that. And TfL, where I headed up major project delivery. And then I had a chance to work on the Olympics as um, the Deputy Director for Transport. So I had seven very, very happy years working on this from the initial planning all the way through to execution. And it was really fantastic to be part of this, this fantastic games in my city and not only in my city, but in my borough and the place where my kids could actually really get something back from the legacy and, and indeed all the communities. So it was a bit of a challenge to work out what to do after that. And then Grosvenor knocked on my door and said, would you come and help us this Grosvenor Properties, the Duke of Westminster's property arm? Can you come and help me projectize what they're doing in terms of property? So I spent a very, very happy year and a bit um, with them, actually you know, introducing what seems to us like basics, but isn't to the building industry. So things like risk management, um, time management, change control, and actually giving them a structure in which they could be more successful. So in that year, they made a hundred million pound profit, which is, of course, not down to me at all. Uh, the market is very buoyant, but it's great to see it all going in the right direction. And then I was asked to come across to CH2M, uh, the program management house, which is now Jacobs, to be their uh, director of rail for Europe. And at that time, we won HS2 as initially the development partner. That moved to delivery partner and then the engineering partner. So it, it was a great, great time to be there. It was a great success. Um, I was really happy. Actually, I didn't want to move. And then KPMG knocked on my door and said, can you come and build up a, 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 an offering to the, the infrastructure business of project management within KPMG? And I just looked at them and I think actually laughed the first time they asked me, said that I don't put project management and KPMG together in the same sentence. But after they, they sort of enticed me to join them and I thought, well, you know what? Why not? Why not? Why not take that challenge of putting those two things together in the same sentence and, and making it happen? So I went in and initially had four people and um, about not a lot of money coming in, sub 100k revenue. I left four years later with 24 people and six and a half million pound revenue. So it was a big success and the big success really was the catalyst. As anyone who builds a business will know of winning a big job and that big job is project representative on high speed two which is effectively the progressive assurance on high speed two. And I'll touch upon that as a case study in, in just a few minutes. Um, as Vedran said, I'm president of the Association of Project Management. One of my presidential pledges is to really push progressive assurance in the uh, industry. We are the best in the UK and we need to maintain being that best. And I am now managing director of transportation for Costain, uh, looking after over half the business, including Crossrail, HS2 and all the highways and aviation. So first off, just a little bit, I mean, everyone knows this about mega projects, but I just think it's good to put it in context. You know, nine out of 10 overspend. You know, can we really do this anymore? Um, as the total capital spend increases, the value of assurance spend decreases, and guess what, things fail. I believe, and this isn't a science, but it's of this order of magnitude, that progressive assurance is a marginal cost to the client. We're talking about 0.1%. Of the, of the actual construction costs. And when you look at prog project and program management costs, they are up to you know, 20, 35, 40%. So really we're good value for money. This next slide, and you'll see some of these slides have little um, footers on that give you uh, the, the um, information where you can actually post questions. So please don't miss them as we go through. This particular one doesn't, but this I think puts into context all the things 
you need to think about when delivering a major project and programme. And I won't go through each one, but it's a myriad of things that are all totally interconnected. And that's what makes mega projects really, really exciting. And here we can see the Menti uh, logo on the left hand side if you want to answer the question on this one. So what is assurance all about? Well, in my view, it's giving confidence of delivery to the client who's obviously spending the money and has specified what they want. So what does that look like and how does it pull together? Well, to make a successful project, you need really good sponsorship. You need this progressive assurance and you need to be an assurance strategy and capability to deliver that. And the how here is some of the options. There's not one size fits all. <clears throat> But there is the project representative progressive assurance. There is coaching and mentoring, and that can be at perm sec level, that can be at CEO level, that can be at the PMO level. Really targeted diagnostic reviews to, to really pick out what the problems are. And then a look also at strategic development and delivery and how that can be provided. So looking first and <clears throat> taking us back to the Olympics, Transport 2012, uh, first time I really came across Assurance uh, properly. And we, we came up with a pulse check idea, which was this really looking at, as you can see in the diagram there, internal reviews, bringing all the stakeholders, we had every single transport operator working in the games, all of those stakeholders together to work out what the problems and risks were. We checked those out, we put them in the Boston uh, matrix and we, we decided then how we're going to manage assurance going forward. And it wasn't that, oh, we've done tick in the box, move on, like an audit. We constantly refreshed this all the way through to, to games time. So it's all based on the plan, do, check approach. It was internal. But I'll tell you what, when you see the next slide, the fact we were doing this at each life cycle phase with all these stakeholders down the right hand side, that gave enormous confidence to people like the NAO who'd come and check uh, on what we're doing to our departments, departments, DCMS and DFT, and to the IPA, and effectively at the end of the day, to Treasury and number 10, because it, this all started the whole beginnings of what the readiness review was to allow the Olympics to proceed. So this is how important it can be. On um, HS2, slightly different scheme, obviously, um, this is just an overview of it for those who aren't um, aware who may be watching this from overseas but phase one we have the go ahead phase 2a the hybrid bill is in place and phase 2b the yellow ones on the right and left hand side are still being brought up into the strategic business case this is the biggest project we've ever had in the uk and it's the biggest project in europe and you know this one 106 billion just for phase one is going to really really test us as an industry it's the most complex thing i've ever worked on I think that anyone's worked on in their lifetime and we want it to be a success. So quickly here, let's look at progressive assurance versus traditional assurance. So I think we all know, um, and this came really from the banking industry initially, the first, second and third lines of defence, very traditional. Uh, again, in different projects and different professions, a slightly different take on each one, but basically first time you check yourself, second time someone else checks you in your division, say, and third time you have an external or an internal person checking what you do and nothing goes out of the building until that happens. What we have on the right hand side is this progressive, much more independent view and looking across many, many lines of inquiry, not just a rigid um, audit plan or a rigid assurance plan. It's called in on an ad hoc basis as and when needed. And how is that decided? That's decided on a risk based approach. So being independent, it's great you have the overview of what's going on. You, you're not sort of blinkered by being either the sponsoring body, the delivery arm or the organisation that's going to receive the uh, infrastructure you're delivering. And, and it's really important because it adds really, really good value for, again, very, very small cost. So here we have this, you know, in a nutshell, it's this holistic view. Um, it's independent, it's real time, it provides confidence. It enables transparency and visibility because when I was P rep on HS2, I could actually come up with recommendations that the DFT should consider as well as the delivery arm and as well as uh, network rail. So we were, although we had a, a paymaster, obviously, in terms of government, 
we were allowed to be totally independent and transparent in what we said. Our findings were then shared with Treasury and IPA and Cabinet Office. So very open. And that made us actually be able to pinpoint things sometimes before they could be pinpointed by the larger, less agile organisations, which I think is a really good positive. But there's one important lesson here that we were assuring we were not advising, because if we advised, then we couldn't actually assure what we had advised would be conflicted out. So we had to be really, really sure that people understood that. And we picked people to do this work that really under understood that such an important distinction. So some implementation considerations. One is to obviously define what sort of scrutiny is needed, um, at what point, uh, when it's business as usual, when it's deep dives. Also de define the lines of inquiry, and I'll touch upon those uh, in a little bit later. They're, they're basically the lines of inquiry that every single project or programme is, is probably likely need, need to address, with some very, very small tweaks on each one. And then really importantly, define how progressive assurance will actually fit in with all the rest of the assurance going on. We all know in the public sector, there's a lot of assurance. And when I first started off in HS2, there's 11 different bodies actually assuring HS2. And I always had a lot of sympathy with the CEOs of HS2 who said like, back off, you know, there's 11 of you, there's one of me. Um, so we went to great lengths to make sure that what we were assuring was knitted together and not a waste of people's time nor money nor efforts which i think it's really important and also to allow the project delivery teams to deliver i've been on the other side when i've been assured to death and it's not a pretty place to be you know you need space you need time to think and you need time to deliver but also i think you also need to have space and the confidence to reach out to the assurers because sometimes they can look at things in a different way that you may not feel you are able to because of your position. So I think, again, that's a very important point. Timely access to um, documents is really key. Assurers are often right at the end of a, of a process. And to do our job properly, we need to see things. So business case, for example, when it's first produced, so we can work with you from the strategic business case all the way through to the final business case. So bring us in, bring us, make us part of your family. We're, we're not the secret police. We're there as your, your sort of left-hand people, uh, critical friends, some people call us. And, and that is important that we have the right people again that have those technical qualities and people qualities to make this a really good success. Uh, thank you. To, so I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. Uh, maybe this is just a good point to remind everyone to engage with the with the live poll. So I've put details here. Uh, you just need to go to menti.com and then enter the code 877693. Um, we have 18 people who responded, uh, if you don't mind, because it's going to be interesting to see this, the, the range of uh, places where people are joining this call. Um, Sue, would you like to continue or do you want me to share the screen just so that we get a little bit of an idea of where our participants are from? I'll just finish these last two very tiny bits, Fedra, and then if you share sure. the screen. Absolutely. So the, yeah. Thank you. The last point is just the um, define the evidence based approach you're going to take and make sure you do use evidence. Otherwise, you've got nothing. You've just got opinion. And then finally, there's a, the triangle below of assurance, risk and governance that really, really do make sure we have successful delivery. Over to you, Vedran. Thank you. I'm sorry I interrupted you before you were able to finish your, your slide. Uh, let me just share this uh, with you. So I just want to show you the, the first. So some of you are asking uh, why are slides not progressing? So we're just on the first question, which is which country are you attending the event from? And you know, we see most people are attending from uh, from the UK, which is not surprising because we're that's where we're based. But we also see uh, some international participants, which is which is very interesting. You know, we have people from Colombia, Germany, um, Iraq, Brazil. So, as I was saying in the beginning, that uh, doing an online event actually has some opportunities, offers some opportunities. I think we are seeing them uh, here. Um, so this is just um, as a, just to see, you know, who else is, is on the call. Um, I will then progress to the next slide. Um, okay, this guess, is great fun, isn't it? This is really yeah, good. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so Sue, so, you know, you can just, uh, you know, plow through, and I'll, uh, I'll move on okay. to the next slide and ask people to. Uh, so, do, do you want to stop sharing then, Bedrin? Yes, we'll do. Yeah. Cool. Can everyone see this? We're back on the same slide. Yeah, Bedrin, can you give me a thumbs up? You can see this. No, uh, no not yet. No. Not yet. OK. How's that? Yeah, I think now it's coming up. Yeah, that's it. Fantastic. Thank you. So we talked about lines of inquiry and, and these are really from the basic strategic objectives through governance funding all the way there through to at the end, number nine, the operational and end state. And as I said, you can make these fit um, really any project or program and you can decide where and when you need to look at each line of inquiry and how much value that's going to give the client. And then what does it look like at the end of the day? Um, well, taking the PREP example, we had a, a monthly report, which when I joined is about 130 pages long of 0.8 font, which no one frankly read. Um, I reduced that down to one page of SRO worries that they should they should stay up at night and worry about with about the three or four page um, summary on the back. That, that made much more of an impact and I think it was much more, well, much better use of public money. And what we were when you see these reporting cycles here, you know, you had the progress reporting, it's always backward looking. What we were able to do is do the forward looking, um, which I think really helped people make decisions. And on top of those monthly reports, we had briefing notes on specific items like baselines, for example. And on each one, we made recommendations that we thought the S either the SRO or the delivery body should take forward. And we monitored those um, recommendations to make sure they were closed out. And we also went in real time to all of the client program boards, panels and reviews. So we were part, we were integrated totally, both with the delivery body Uh, yes, I also can't hear you, Sue. So um, you either went on mute or something else happened. Okay, I'll, I'll start yeah, again. You're back. Where, you're back now. You're back. Yep. Where did you lose me? Uh, it just broke off halfway through us through the sentence, probably twenty seconds ago. Oh, no problem. So we'll just yeah. take it up from the uh, being adaptable and have a framework because we're very agile. So my team yeah. on PREP was eight people. Um, there's 1,500 in uh, HST Limited and there's 130 in the client side. So it just gives you that idea. And here we've got Vedrin coming up with some. Oh, sorry, I didn't know it would, it would take over your slide. But I just yeah. wanted to show, you know, we have uh, in terms of participation, it's it's really fantastic because actually you can see that we have uh, very experienced uh, project practitioners on the call. Uh, most people with 10 plus years of industry experience, which is fantastic. So, yeah, I'm just going to stop sharing now and move on to the next slide. Lovely. Thanks, Pedro. So here we are, uh, hoping everyone can see this and hear me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. So, so they're the benefits there of progressive insurance. We we had a, a really good gathering. You can see the great and the good here. Uh, Tony Meggs, Roy, you're here as well, in shining Technicolor, and and Martin. We we had a really good session on what progressive insurance now is the time. This is now about two, maybe three years ago, and the interesting thing was. We, we tested the audience to see what they thought assurance was. And these are the sort of responses we had um, before the presentations and assurance. And, and you'll recognize some of these, you know, the tick box exercise, 
you know, projects fail with or without assurance, you know, all, all the kind of negatives. And you'll see that uh, some of your, one of your questions is what you feel about assurance. So maybe we'll compare and contrast at the end of this. But the testimonials from the clients are very strong. Um, progressive assurance is, is needed as a sponsor body to give credibility, for example. Um, it's a penalty. It's, it's, it's not a penalty, it's a prize. It allows teams to be creative rather than reactive. It provides value benefits and saves time. I'm not going to read them all, but there's some really good testimonials that this does make a difference, which is why we're really interested in, in promoting it for the UK. So this is um, this came from um, the at the end of that presentation. And the big thing that came through to me was this idea about being independent, giving confidence and giving confidence in delivery on the risk based approach. So this is the one, and you'll see it's question seven there on the left-hand side. Maybe you'd like to add your thoughts to that. And then finally, lessons learned. I mean, this, if no one's read this document, it's superb. Um, it's written by Alan Over of DFT together with IPA. And, uh, Sorry, there's someone talking on the... Thank you. Um, it's well worth reading because it's not just the usual lessons learned, you know, full stop, move on. It, it talks about behaviours, it talks about people. And um, I've just brought out here the the um, the value and the limitations of independent assurance, which I think is quite powerful. Um, it is good, but use it wisely and use it in the context that it's needed. So that to me is an endorsement of, of progressive assurance. And um, I think the more lessons we can learn and the more evidence we can gather on the value of assurance, the better, which is why I've asked um, APM to actually, as part of its uh, research project, to look into that. I want to know the values so that we can really, really use that to, to convince people to, to really get behind us. So that, that's it. I'm at the end of my uh, presenting time. I'd like to thank you all very much for your patience and thanks to everyone who helped make this happen and the IT so far has stood up. <laughs> um, so over to you really for any questions you may have. Very happy to take them. Bedrin. Thank you so much, Sue, uh, for the thought provoking uh, presentation. Uh, what I would do now before we move on to the to the Q&A uh, is I'd just like to run through these slides of the targeted questions that we had. Uh, at the moment, we are having people responding to the question of what does project assurance mean to you? Let me just share the screen with you. So I would I would like you to I would encourage you to put in um, your thoughts in the Menti survey. I'll just share this with you. OK, can you see this? Yeah. So this is a word cloud of the three words that first come to your mind when thinking about project assurance. I don't know, Sue, have you got any thoughts about what we're seeing here? I think that's remarkably similar to the one I showed. It's really quite fascinating. The only thing that doesn't jump out on that is independence, but the confidence and the risk and the, the quality, um, that's, that's very powerful. Transparency is in there as well. It's good. Great. OK, so um, let's now move on to the uh, other question that we had that actually came in uh, before this one. So I'll just move on to the other slide. Uh, it's actually before this one. May, some of you may have actually responded to it because I've then moved on to the to this word cloud. But it is um, it's what non monetary value does assurance give a client? So if you don't mind providing your thoughts in here and uh, I believe you can all see the answers kind of scrolling through the screen. Yeah, there's a there's a big emphasis on confidence in this, isn't there? Uncertainty of outcome, which is exactly what you, know, you ask any client what you really want and that's exactly what they want. Yeah, confidence, opportunity to improve, quality, delivery, confidence. Decision making is an interesting one. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was uh, cropped up while you were uh, 
um, going through your slides as well. Identifying problems ahead. Oh, I just lost it now. Yeah, and save remedial action for further ahead. Stitch in time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I think this is, uh, you know, it gives us a, a broad range of ideas of uh, what uh, non-monetary value does assurance uh, give a client. Um, and uh, certainly we have a range of ideas here. Um, so I would be keen now to move on to the, to the next question. So uh, please hold on because I will change the slide that you'll see in your, um, on your screens, and this will be um, okay. So our next question is whether project assurance depends on the sector, and we are mainly talking about um, infrastructure and infrastructure projects, but whether project assurance is something which is sector agnostic or not. And we see some answers cropping up here. I don't know, Sue, any comments on this, what you see in the little dots piling up? It's, yeah, it's interesting as we see it, because you know, the, the argument on project management generally is it, if you're a good project manager, you should be able to work in any sector and understand it. Um, so this, this is pointing to, to a similar thing. If you have a methodology and um, the tools and the people, it then really boils down to the um, vocabulary being slightly different, the location, the outcomes, but I think I think we're saying here it is sector agnostic and that we can use it um, at will in any sector, which is great. That makes it even a stronger string to our bow. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, we're talking really about somewhat of a domain uh, uh, of mm -hmm. practice which can be applied across across different sectors. And we seem to have consensus in the amongst participants and amongst the audience regarding this, which I think is a uh, Remarkable. OK, so um, let's take our next question, which is how can we me measure the value of assurance? And just for change, what I'll do, I'll stop sharing for a second, just not to bias you with the with the responses that are cropping up. And then I'll share within a minute once we've we've had a few answers on the screen, if you don't mind. So I'll just give you a few seconds. Can we have a few more responses, please, before I share it with the group? Thank you very much. I see them cropping up. Okay. We're, we're waiting in anticipation now, Vedran. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> OK, so please continue um, sharing your, your insights here. But this is, uh, this is what we have so far. Any comments, Sue, on what you see? Interesting. I mean, to me, the client satisfaction definitely outcomes achieved. That's the that's the nirvana, isn't it? That's the nirvana. Um, but I also think it can be used in baselining and benchmarking as well so that we can get better at delivering these major projects and programs. I know each one's unique, but if we can use the data we've got from them and, and help us make decisions from one project to another, what we're very bad at in the UK is just, you know, 
building the Olympics and then going to cross rail and doing everything in a very different way and doing it in a different way again in HS2 when really there's a lot of fundamentals that can be the same. I think alignment to the business case jumps out to me as well because you know, you get your approval in business cases and you constantly got to go back to reaffirm that approval. If you've got assurance behind you, it's powerful in terms of influencing people. The As, as head of PREP, I used to sit on the, um, the board of DFT when all the investment uh, requests came up so that, and I was asked for my opinion before that request went through. That That's powerful. Um, again, that's the independent aspect. Risk mitigation, that's good. It's all about risk. I totally agree with that. And a good relationship with stakeholders is spot on because, you know, you can reinforce messages on behalf of people really deeply involved in the project and, and help them um, when they can't actually reach out themselves. Very interesting. I also, what jumps out to me is uh, KPIs and analytics. KPIs, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, is there a way, do you think, Sue, those can be, so project assurance can be made part of our, you know, kind of traditional thinking about projects and performance in projects and then how this can be incorporated in, in sort of a data analytics framework? I think, I think you can, but it's slightly different from sort of project representative progressive assurance world. It's more a program management office approach which again is what we had on the Olympics. We had a, a team that actually brought all that data together, that did all the reporting, that questioned the delivery partners, the sponsor bodies, and you know, it was the engine room, if you like, and then it could look at trending in that data, it could look at forecasting, et cetera, et cetera. So I think yes, but in a slightly different guise. And I think, you know, from a personal point of view, some PMO offices have really deviated from their intent, which was partly to do that, to just to become administrative centres. So I think the more we can move to programme assurance offices, um, the better it would be for everyone. OK, thank you. Well, thank you, everyone, for your contributions to the live poll. I think we may have one or two more questions. Um, maybe one before we move on to the actual Q&A. So I'd be keen to move on to the next one. And so I'll just change the question on your um, screens now. And OK, so the next question is, what do you think the role of Project Assurance will be in the world of post-COVID-19? And we've given you a few options here. Uh, and I did the same thing I did before, which is um, stopped sharing uh, so that uh, <laughs> I don't uh, bias you with, uh, with the responses. So I'll share in a second. We'll just give you yeah. a, a minute. It's interesting, isn't it, to reflect at the moment in the, you know, is it post-COVID world or is it middle of COVID world? <laughs> yes, um, yes. But, but so, so much has changed. And, you know, when you look at, you know, transportation, which is my specialism, you know, we've got network rail now that is not the network rail it was pre-COVID. It's, it's got virtually no passengers. Um, the, the talks have all gone back into the public sector. There's a real worry and the fear about people using that service going forward. Um, there's a, the CEO looking at not big major projects, but the customer experience, biodiversity, sustainability. It's a completely different set of challenges. TFL is now virtually bankrupt. Um, so, so how does it kind of get back together and help be that lifeblood for London? Aviation has tanked as an industry, so what's that going to look like in two or three years' time? And then the bigger rail industry, you know, the, the cross rails almost coming to completion and HS2 going ahead. All of those, it means it's a very mixed bag. And then you throw in people not using public transport and using roads. Oh, we were trying to get people off the roads to make it greener, quicker and the rest of it. So. It's a different world. So the answer to this would be very interesting. Which is kind of what I see in the in the little dots piling up around different options that we've given you. So what, one thing is clear that no one thinks that project assurance will be much less important than before. <laughs> there are some people who think it will be a little bit less important than before, but most people think it's either going to be a lot more important or a little more important. So in any case, more important than 
um, what it currently is. And there are some people who think that it's going to be about the same as before. I think this is really interesting because I would I would encourage everyone to keep your uh, thoughts and mark these ideas. Uh, and then when we move on to the next slide, uh, if there is anything that specifically, you know, you think we should be addressing, please post it as a question so we can actually we can address it in the Q&A. So I think this gives us a good overview. So most people think the importance of uh, uh, project assurance will only be higher than what it is now. So Sue, I, I believe that uh, you agree with this uh, assertion. Uh, I, I don't totally do, Vedran, and I think it's going to be more important and it has to be more agile. You know, if we take uh, any learnings at the moment, we, we have to do things at speed uh, to make change and to prop up the economy as well. So I think important definitely to give that confidence and that certainty to be more agile as well. So really fire in teams, you know, to go and sort it out and get sprints going and, you know, all the rest of sort of agile thinking. It, it's reality now. We've moved away from traditional ways of working. Yeah, absolutely agree. Good, so let me move on to the next um, poll question, which is, it's our actual Q&A. So uh, what I would ask you all to do now, I think there is about 40 plus people in the room. Uh, please think about, you know, obviously everything that we've talked about here and the poll interaction and, you know, what other participants, uh, you know, the ideas that they shared with others. And post a question here, which we will then address in the next 15 or, or, or so minutes in the Q&A. So this uh, functionality, so this question in the Menti poll gives you the option not only to, uh, to ask a question, but also to see all of the other questions that uh, participants have asked. And it gives you the option to vote, uh, as in you click a like button, which will give us an idea of um, of a sort of a ranking of questions uh, for us to focus on in the remaining 15 or so minutes. So I would really um, like to encourage you to think about a question in the next 30 seconds or a minute or so before we uh, before we move on. And, and please don't feel constrained um, by asking me questions on progressive assurance. If you have any other questions you'd like to ask me, very happy to answer those. Um, Sue, we have some questions in the chat box as well. So some people. We do. Um, that aren't using Menti, so you might want to have a look at that while we're waiting for the Menti question. Thank you, yeah. So we've got one from so, Giuliano, um, yeah. who's saying, given uh, the new context drivers, what sectors could provide lessons about customer experience, satisfaction to infrastructure? Do you know what I think this is really interesting having three sectors under my sort of directorship there's there's so much learning from the aviation industry in terms of you know the passenger experience um, making people feel they're getting value for money they're feeling safe they will get to their destination the best time if we can take that learning from um, the aviation industry and apply it to highways apply it to um, rail as well, I think we'd start to see a very, very different approach. And I think that's that's what network rail is actually thinking of at the moment. How is England are actually making that their pledge? It, it's all about passengers. So I think it's it's picking the really best bits of aviation and using it uh, across the industry. We have Robin. one more here. Yeah, Robin Wilkin. Yeah, hi, Robin. Um, with regard to independence, do you feel it would be better for Cabinet Office or Treasury? Ah, OK, that's a very good question, Robin. And, and I think, you know, when you reflect on it, the answer has to be yes. 
you know, I know it's kind of often in government, where is, where is the budget? So the budget is here. So it's, it's actually easier to use this budget than that budget. But to have the IPA or, or Cabinet Office or Treasury own that, the, the budget that pays for PREP, I think, be much, much better. And I Excellent. Think Sarah, so, yeah. Oh, Sarah's just asked if she, if she can get a okay. copy of the slides and stuff. That's no problem. Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. we will share um, the mentee slides as well with you. Uh, the, so we can share those with you. Uh, so in the meantime, we've got our mentee questions here and uh, I shared them with the group. So the first one is how do you integrate different audit frameworks into unified assurance system? Can I just ask you while we are going through those, I see that not many people have um, voted for the questions. So if you don't mind, there's 13 questions and it's probably more than what we can possibly address in the next 12 minutes. So if you don't mind kind of voting for the most relevant one so we can focus on maybe three or four questions in the remaining 10 minutes. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, uh, so how do you integrate different audit frameworks is, is the first question. It's, it's a really good question. I, I went into one organisation, which I won't give you the name of, um, to try and establish an assurance system and they had the, and Roy, sorry about this, but they had, they had the audit camp of people who just wouldn't buy assurance at all and wouldn't even talk. Uh, it took me about four weeks to, to have that conversation properly and to, to be seen not as a threat and to realise you've got to work together. So my, my really quick answer to this from my experience is you get the professionals in a room together explaining what they're doing and why, what the outcomes are against the timeline and then work collectively and collaboratively to come up with an integrated, proper integrated assurance plan that you can all buy into that gives the client the best value for money and the best outcomes that he or she wants. And this is the Brilliant. this is the cracking question on this one. With all this assurance, why, why is everything going wrong? <laughs> <laughs> why isn't it a perfect world? It's a really, really good question. And, and I think there's there's many reasons for this. In fact, um, I, I ran a sort of review when I was at KPMG looking at, you know, the the normal ones, you know, the Olympics, Crossrail, HS2, Tideway, all of them saying, look, what's going wrong? We looked at, we had a whole long list of reasons why things are going wrong. But the irony is it boiled down to basics and two fundamental basics. One was lack of design management. Designers were designing what the heck they wanted. No one was checking it. It's going out of the door. And we would specified Brixton Station and we, we got um, some pancreas. You know, that that's and if you compound that and compound it for a major project or program, you, you're in serious trouble in terms of money. And the second really, really simple one is the cost estimates. Again, they were not being checked at base. You know, it, those lines of defence weren't being used. And when it went from one scale to another scale to another scale, up the organisations and out to the real world, people were putting risk on risk, contingency on contingency, and it was just basically out of control. So there's nothing smart or clever here. It's basic good design management and really good estimating. Great. So I'm just marking the questions as they're um, as they're voted. So the second one with four votes is uh, the one that should show up. So we've had that one on why, why projects go yeah. wrong. Yeah, it's this one. How do you integrate? So this one's answered. Second one is. We had the integration one. I think is there a risk one? Oh yeah. Okay. Sorry about yeah. that. This is answered. This is okay. the third one. This is good. Thank you. Where should assurance report to? And uh, Robin will know we've both sort of shared our experiences um, on this. I, th I think assurance has to report to be credible. So take an example again at HS2. The program board on HS2 is the culmination of, of their reporting, thinking, decision making. It has to report to that delivery arm program board and through their governance. So through all the boards that feed up to that. And it has to report back into the sponsor organisation. If you don't get the buy in along the route and there's no way everyone's going to agree with all your recommendations, they will 
actually very strongly disagree with some. You've evidenced them if you believe they're right, you stick with them, but they go through that whole of the government. So the client side and the delivery side together. And to make a real impact, it can't be cut off at, if you like, a sponsor board level within a client. It's got to go right to the top. So right to what used to be BIC in DFT, the investment committee. It has to go to that level. Otherwise, you, you could find your voices not being heard by those really crucial decision makers. Brilliant. Thank you for that. So um, let's move on to the next question. It should show up. Uh, is there a risk that with a focus on agility, real time involvement, etc., progressive assurance just becomes a new form of first line assurance? Excellent question. Excellent. Because when this whole concept of speed came out, you know, build better, greener and faster, I thought, well, yeah, I get it. But you know, what's happened to all that route map thinking about concentrating on the front end of projects and programs and getting it right? So you're chucking the baby out with the bathwater. But what's transpired over the last um, few months has been absolutely insightful. So we've had projects and programs that have been put on ice for 10, 15 years just because they went into the slightly too difficult box. And what's happening is they've been dragged out of that too difficult box, um, taking them to workshops with clients, with consultants, with contractors, just spending some brainstorming time on these for one or two days and coming out with things like we can deliver this two years early for 30 percent less and give you better outcomes because people are finding that freedom to think. We're taking the constraints of the systems away from them. And we all know governance can be a constraint. It's a good thing, but it can constrain. Organisations constrain. Gateway processes are great, but they can constrain. When you take all of that away, you all of a sudden end up with a whole new agile real world, which I think is fantastic. And the, the assurance has to keep up with that. Um, so it won't be the first line of assurance. Um, it will be a continuing line of assurance. And again, really light of touch and, and looking at where the risks really lie and how those need to be resolved to deliver all of these new ways of working that we've got in front of us. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Sue. So I'll just mark this one as answered. <clears throat> oh. No. Yeah, emerging technology helping project assurance. I, I haven't seen technology move at such a fast rate in my lifetime. Um, you know, the fact of speaking on teams now, you know, nine months ago, people go, what? <laughs> Never. Why aren't you in your office? Why aren't you having a big meeting in a big meeting room somewhere? It's, it's moving at a tremendous rate. I mean, we're finding in transport in particular, um, the, the, the technology, the smart way of thinking, the smart way of using motorways, the smart way of using trains, it's here, it's with us, the smart way of working. And how does it help the progress, um, the process of project assurance? It, it means it is totally in real time. So no one can say, no, you've got to wait two weeks until I finish this because you can actually make them share it as they're doing it as we are now. And there's no excuses anymore. So that technology also enables, I think, and this is a really exciting bit, is the sectors to come together. So when we realised the aviation industry had tanked, at Costain, we looked into thermal imaging cameras, not to sell cameras, but to look at the data analytics of what those cameras said so we could remotely monitor if someone had a temperature before they even knew it. That started off in aviation. TFL were really impressed. We presented to their board. Network Railgun actually would like some of that. People like the um, BT police. Yes, please, because it means you can manage people in big crowds without worrying them or making them more anxious than they are now. So that's a kind of assurance with a, a wider meaning of the word, but it, it provides assurance to people. And I think in the here and now, in our mid-COVID world, the, the big issue everyone has is fear. We fear virtually of everything. So if we can make people feel more comfortable by assuring them using technology, it's better. So it's probably not so much more project assurance, with the exception, I guess, when we're looking at things like um, climate change impact on embankments, where technology really can really hands-on provide project assurance. So it, 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 technology is here, 
it's it's changing everything out of all recognition and I think it's going to help both the people and culture and society and, and also specifics on projects. Fascinating. Um, let's see if we can maybe go through one or two more. How can you apply an assurance approach with organizations who are not familiar with the assurance approach and do not share the same culture? Yeah, that the key here is you can't apply it. You've got to work with the teams to really have them understand that they need it. And how do you do that? You bring in examples from other sectors. You bring in people from other sectors who've been part of that. Um, we're building a very strong assurance community in the UK. You know, we can reach out to APM, SIGS, um, boys a uh, leader of the assurance SIG, and that's across all sectors. So we can, if people don't believe what we're saying, we can bring in other people to convince that this really is a good approach and, and it will help them in delivery. When you, when you can evidence that someone's going to help make their lives better and easier, yeah, generally people buy into it. Okay, next one. What would you avoid in assurance from your experience? Where are the pitfalls? <laughs> my, my number one pitfall is don't employ people who don't understand it. <laughs> so you employ these people who want to assure a project and they go in like the Gestapo and, and tell people what to do. And it is painful, painful to watch that because you can, you can find you've built up this rapport with the people over 18 months and it takes one person to go in there just to completely deck it. So that's the number one thing. Make sure the people you've got really understand assurance and also understand people. OK, thank you, Sue. Uh, right. I mean, we are really out of time now. Uh, it's four o'clock and I believe we we scheduled this to be one hour, right? I think we are. We should be wrapping up. Am I not? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So I'd be keen for us to um, wrap up here. Obviously, there is a lot more questions. Um, here that we can answer, uh, that, you know, that we can discuss and surely there will be many more points to discuss, but uh, we can take these conversations, well, offline would be the term to use, but I don't think <laughs> any conversations can be really taken offline in the world of uh, COVID and post-COVID. But um, I would really um, like us all to thank uh, Sue for her wonderful contribution. Uh, also, you know, Chizoba and Elaine who've uh, helped to contribute to the organization of the session. And uh, and every one of you for being so wonderfully uh, engaged through, you know, the, the responding to the poll questions and asking the really thought provoking questions. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it has been a, a great uh, session. We will uh, follow up with all of you uh, with slides, uh, uh, both the presentation slides as well as the Menti uh, slides, which provides you know your responses. And I believe we will also have this uh, uploaded on the website of the Bartley School of Construction Project Management uh, that you can then share with your networks for anyone who might be interested in in watching the, the seminar afterwards. So once again, thank you very much, all of you, for, for participating. And we'll be in touch at some point in the future. Uh, we don't have uh, the next seminar planned yet, but I'm sure that we will uh, keep you posted uh, when we do. Thanks a lot, everyone. And I don't know, Sue, if there's anything yeah. you want. Uh, you know, we, we had some amazing technical glitches before this, so the, the gods were with us, which is great. And I think everyone's questions were superb, organisation superb. If you feel you want to contact me personally um, to find out more about anything, I'm very, very happy to do that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.